Welcome to SSI Meetup. It's very exciting for me to be with you here today again. And we've taken a little bit of a break. As many of you know, we published Self-Sovereign Identity some time ago. That took up a lot of effort between Drummond, I, and many other people that um, contributed to this book. Luckily, in, I think it has been very well received in the SSI space, and I think it has helped in many parts of the world to, to popularize um, as, um, SSI. And yeah, but this also meant we had less time for SSI Meetup, but, um, and then in between we had COVID, um, plus other things that happened in life. But now we're back with a little bit of a different format. Um, and what we're planning to do, instead of having the live format as we had in the past, where we had to stick to a specific time, just gonna record these sessions with different guests. And, the, and we will have also a new host. So the new host is James Monahan. Um, James and I, we've been working together in the past at Evanim. Actually, he hired me into Evanim. So um, thanks to him, I got into the space. And I'm really happy that we can do something together again. It's always great to, to, to work with good friends. And yeah, so James um, um, will be um, presenting this very first show after this little break we had. And in this next slide, basically, um, we see that um, what it's about, it's about building SSI products, a guide for product managers. And we believe this is a very exciting subject because as the SSI space has been growing, um, I think there's also more of a demand for professionals in the space that understand this technology. And before we go into the details, um, let us review briefly what the SSI meetup objectives are. So as you know, if you've watched the previous 60 shows, this is 61, is to empower the global SSI community. We still want to contribute to this, just um, in a different time frame and format. This is open to everyone interested in SSI and all the content is the, this is the key aspect is shared with the CC by SA license, which basically means you can reuse this material that James is sharing with you today. Just please give credit back to him and SSI Meetup and hopefully, um, someone in the world or many people in the world will benefit from this as, as it has been in the past with other SSI meetup shows. And yeah, so really excited. Uh, we're recording this between the two of us. So the, differently to how we used to do this in the past where we would have get, um, other people joining and they could ask questions during the presentation. I'll ask some questions, maybe yes, maybe not. And as we test this out, we will learn what works best and, and also what everyone else likes. So James, thank you so much for becoming co-host of SSI Meetup, uh, which makes my life easier and also exciting to be able to work with you. Uh, likewise, Alex, I'm really looking forward to it. Cool. All right, well, should we get started? The uh, the first the first one after the hiatus, cool, all right. So um, the plan is to uh, to keep this fairly, uh, fairly action orientated. Um, I'll bore you with a very small introduction about me and, and why I chose this topic uh, for the one that I wanted to uh, to kick off this new season of SSI Meetup with why, why it's important to me. Um, most of the time, uh, we'll be talking about uh, SSI and decentralized identity for product managers. Um, so for, for people who might not necessarily know uh, as much as uh, some of the SSI community, um, but there's some uh, actionable tips in there about how to talk about the benefits, uh, what the challenges are, and uh, there's a worked example as well. Um, and then uh, just before we cap it off, we we'll also do a bit of a refresher on some product management basics for uh, folks in the SSI community, because there's a lot of technology folks in the SSI community. There's not, not a ton of, uh, of, of product folks. Um, so uh, why, why am I specifically giving this talk? Um, I've spent my career doing product things. Uh, I've been a product leader at three technology startups now, uh, one in the mobile payments and uh, messaging space, and two in the digital identity space. Um, at the moment, I'm a freelance uh, startup advisor and, and consultant, uh, working with a few different companies, uh, mostly focused on decentralized identity. Um, and I'm also incubating a couple of uh, a couple of new ventures on the side. Um, but uh, but my journey to SSI started off via uh, centralized uh, kind of hub-based identity, and then, as Alex mentioned, uh, he and I worked together at Evanim uh, in the early days of, of the industry. Um, and uh, really, I, I got the bug then, and have been have been hooked ever since. Um, so what I think we need is more products built using SSI. Uh, and I want those products to be more successful than they currently are. Um, and I see a couple of big barriers to this. And so that's what I'm really hoping to, to try and address in this talk. The first is that uh, we in the uh, identity community uh, know about SSI, we know about DIDs, verifiable credentials, we know how cool they are. 
Um, but but we haven't done a great job of evangelizing that in the wider industry. So we're the only people who know about it. Uh, and we're mostly solving identity problems with them. Um, but as I'll talk about, uh, I think there's actually um, a lot of uh, different ways to frame the benefits of this family of technologies that can uh, have lots of use in wider industry. And I think uh, I think we do ourselves and everyone else a favor by uh, learning to talk about things that way. Um, I also see less uh, quality product management uh, than I would like to in the SSI community. Uh, this isn't meant as a flight on, on anyone. I know we're all, we're all trying hard and a lot of folks uh, are small teams in much bigger companies or, or startups that uh, they don't have the resources for a full product function. But there's a lot of tech driven um, thinking in the industry and there's less focus on businesses and frankly less focus on user problems even though we talk about user centricity a lot um, and so i'm sort of hoping to bring some of those threads to life uh, in, in this talk as well but enough set up let's uh, let's dive in so we can start with a simple definition uh, most people who have listened to to these podcasts before um, obviously will have have a good frame of reference for what we mean when we say SSI. Um, the, the Wikipedia definition uh, says that self-sovereign identity is an approach to digital identity that gives individuals control over the information that they use to prove who they are. That's a very useful, uh, although identity-centric uh, definition. People use decentralized identity, portable identity, Web3, even Web5, ID tech. There's a family of related terms. Um, for the talk I'm giving today, um, I don't really mean SSI in the sense of identity. I'm, I'm using it as shorthand because all of those other terms are a bit more cumbersome. But I'm generalizing it a bit. What I'm mostly talking about today is a system for portable, high fidelity data, which enables a more decentralized and user-centric approach to solving business problems. So my belief is that that, that framing of what we're doing, which can, can certainly be used to give individuals greater sovereignty over their their personal data, but can also do lots of other useful things, is a really exciting new tool in the toolbox when product managers come to look at user problems and, and come up with solutions. So the relevant building blocks uh, of SSI that a product manager should be aware of are uh, a couple of the fundamental primitives. There's decentralized identifiers. These are unique identifiers which users create and control themselves rather than renting from some central authority. So unlike an email address that you might get from Google, uh, these are things that you create and store yourself. Um, and verifiable credentials. These are digital documents that can be verified without requiring access to the original source of that underlying data. Um, and those two together uh, give you this portable high fidelity data that I was talking about. Um, and the third pillar are uh, what I'm loosely calling trust task protocols. Um, that's a phrase I'm, I'm borrowing from the Trust Over IP Foundation. But basically, these are the frameworks for interacting with and kind of transacting about uh, claims and credentials. So the way you move these things around, essentially, and, and derive meaning from them. And with those three things, you can start building uh, SSI systems. So what is the superpower that SSI gives you? Why am I so excited that uh, product managers, not just in the identity community, but in wider industry, um, should, should want to know about this? I think it gives you a fundamentally different and, dare I say, more natural way to think about the interactions between systems and people, a different way to model that than, than you might have in the past. Because the recipient of some data can independently verify the source, integrity, validity, and ownership of a proof of a claim that they receive directly from the subject. So there's a few bits to unpack, which we'll, which we'll get to as we talk about the benefits individually. But, but that very thing, the fact that you can have information that passes via an individual to the relying party rather than through, uh, through some central hub or some other third party system, and yet is imbued with the same level of trust as if you got it directly from the issuer, that lets you think very differently about whole categories of user problems. Um, and that's what I'm uh, that's what I'm really passionate about seeing get more adopted in, in industry. So we're going to talk through a few of the benefits. Um, as we do so, uh, we're going to talk about not just what they are and, and how to think about them, but um, how to talk about who might receive that benefit and how it might show up, um, because not all of these benefits matter in all use cases. And there can be a real tendency to want to manifest as much of the goodness of self-sovereign identity uh, all in one go at every opportunity we get. And that is that is worthy. Um, but as a, as a product person, that puts the technology ahead of the actual value proposition for the user. And we must always be 
trying to focus on what the relevant benefits are for the user. So as we go through these, I'll be positing uh, which, uh, how you might want to think about them in terms of which users benefit and how. Um, I also think it's worth acknowledging uh, this is just the way I choose to talk about them. These are not Kim Cameron's laws of identities. These are not Christopher Allen's 10 principles of self-sovereign identity. They're not many of the, uh, the exhaustive bulleted lists <clears throat> that luminaries in the industry have come up with. Um, this is just my personal rubric that I've found helpful when, when working with customers in the industry. <clears throat> so the first one is portability. I mentioned portable high fidelity data at the very outset. That's the thing I'm very excited about. When I say portability, the point here is it allows you to move data between contexts via the user, right? So I can take information from my civic life, like I could take a, a driver's license or I could take a passport or something like that, and I can use it in uh, in my private life. I can use it to check out a library book perhaps or open a bank account, things like that. Um, that ability that we take for granted in the analog world, like I can take my physical driver's license into the bank to prove who I am, um, we all know in the SI community is deceptively hard to do online. Um, but it's not just about identity, it's about anything. I could take my utility bill, I could take my degree certificate, I could take my purchase history with me from a supermarket context and use it in a completely different context because that data goes via me, not via some, uh, some other third party intermediary. And so for businesses, that means that rather than everyone who might be a source of data and everyone who might be a consumer of data all having to integrate with each other, um, instead of that, I can just go via the user. It's very elegant. I also can avoid the alternative of all of these different entities plugging into one central hub. Uh, having to build one of those would be costly. It's very limiting because you've got to decide who's allowed in and who's isn't and so on and so forth. So actually, it radically simplifies how you can think about getting data from A to B. And of course, for individuals, um, it's just more natural. As I mentioned, we do this all the time with, with physical credentials. Um, so it, it seems much more natural that we should do this with, with our digital information as well. Um, and it gives you the most leverage for every individual credential. So instead of them being bounded in their individual context and my, my driver's license only be useful for proving that I'm allowed to operate a motor vehicle, um, it lets me use it in all the other domains of life where that, that credential might be useful. So, so portability, I think, is, is one of the most potent benefits that we can, uh, we can bring with uh, SSI technologies. Uh, the next in the list is, is authenticity. Um, we talk about this a great deal because, of course, the, the clever part of a verifiable credential is that it is structured data that's cryptographically signed. Um, so that means you can verify who made the claim, uh, you can verify that it hasn't been tampered with, you can verify it hasn't been revoked, and you can verify that the person who's providing that, that evidence to you, that proof, uh, is indeed the same person or the same entity that it was issued to. So all of that, the source integrity, validity, ownership, that is made possible um, by the way that these things are digitally signed with uh, keys that can be looked up on a verifiable data registry. Uh, what that means if you're a business is that if you trust the owner, uh, sorry, if you trust the issuer, then you can trust what the owner is saying about themselves because that data came from the issuer and, and you know that. And it doesn't really matter how it got to you because you know it hasn't been tampered with, you know it really belonged to the, the, the person who's showing you and so on and so forth. Um, so again, that lets you reframe how you tackle these problems. You don't have to directly integrate with the source every time. You can be a bit more flexible about, about how you get the data. Um, and for users, um, that just means it's going to be much easier to provide the data that's required in any given situation. So you can prove what's needed to to accomplish a task without repetition and without proving any more than you might need to in that scenario, which again is, uh, is, is very useful. Composability is uh, another important benefit. So this is about combining uh, claims from multiple different credentials into a single proof. And so uh, when you think about a job application, for example, uh, for a job application, you might need to prove uh, who you are um, according to the government or some trusted source, uh, where you live so that they can send you your paycheck, um, and that you have the relevant uh, academic qualifications, say, so from a, a reputable university, and that you got a certain passing grade and things like that. Um, and you know, you might do that by filling in a form, and then all those things have to be checked or, or perhaps not checked, um, and uh, and that's a massive pain. Whereas if you had credentials for each of those things, so a passport from uh, from the government that's shown in green. Uh, might contain lots and lots of different attributes, not all of which are relevant for this use case. 
to prove your address, you might find your, your rental agreement, your tenancy agreement. Um, that would show that, uh, that this is the place that you're legally allowed to live. Um, and uh, again, your university degree uh, from the, the recognized institution, that would have all the details you need to prove that you've got the right qualification. And what, uh, what a, a verifiable presentation does is allow you to combine attributes from each of those uh, credentials into a single proof. And so all of those same things that we said about verifying the source, uh, authenticity, integrity, et cetera, that applies to this, this compound proof as well. So for a business, you can have access to a much wider universe of data than those that exist just in your ecosystem. So if there are a bunch of uh, academic institutions that are issuing and, and, uh, and, and verifying credentials, that's great for education use cases, but it's not so useful for, uh, for employment and for all these downstream use cases. But um, if they're able to traffic <clears throat> in these other ecosystems because of the portability benefit then you also get this uh, this added composability benefit where when combined with legal identity from a passport proof of address and rental agreement that one university degree credential becomes even more useful um, it also means that the issues of those credentials uh, don't have to be experts at all the other uh, aspects of uh, of a person's identity so um, for that university degree to be sufficient for a job application um, you would uh, you would need many other details besides just the qualification on it that might be outside the university's expertise to issue, but no need here because actually you can leave uh, you can lean on the government credential for the proof of uh, proof of identity, proof of residence, for example. Um, they don't have to be experts at that, and so that really lets people just focus uh, on the the areas that they are experts in and leave the rest to to other experts. Um, for users, <clears throat> I think these benefits uh, mirror some of those that we talked about just a moment ago, in that it really makes the credentials you have available to you um, even more useful because you can remix them and combine them with these other ones. Uh, and again, it's like we would do in the real world where we might gather a bunch of different bits of paper to prove things about ourselves, um, except in that scenario, you're often, often having to share the entire thing, which might contain lots of details that you don't want to, whereas here, uh, we're just sharing the, uh, the bits that are most relevant. Now we talk a lot about the importance of privacy uh, when we talk about self-sovereign identity. It's, it's a, a, I think, a fundamental uh, cause that's very close to, to many SSI practitioners' hearts, and, and for good reason. Um, when we talk about privacy, mostly in this context, we mean the ability to prove only what is required when when sharing this data. Uh, and there's a few ways that can show up depending on the technology choices that you've made. So, uh, one of these is that you can do selective disclosure of claims. So. As I alluded to in the previous example, um, you could choose to reveal just a couple of attributes from a particular credential rather than the whole thing. Um, and that means that uh, you're not uh, oversharing. For example, I don't need to share my, my full address just to prove that I'm a resident of a given country, for example. Um, another form of privacy that, that many of these schemes enable is non-correlation. So uh, I can make one proof over here and another proof over there. Uh, and, and if I'm just revealing uh, facts about myself that aren't uniquely identifying, then there's nothing else about making those proofs that lets them be tied back to me. So I think that's that's often overlooked, but, but incredibly important because selective disclosure by itself doesn't give you privacy. Just being able to say, oh, I, I just revealed my, uh, revealed my first name or revealed my date of birth. Um, if you're sharing something else that uniquely identifies you, like a serial number or like a, a public key, for example, that can still be used like a giant cookie to track you everywhere you go. Um, but some of the technology choices you can make uh, prevent against that. So you can have really, really good privacy, which again, lets you design different types of interactions that you might not have thought you're able to when you're, when you're trying to solve these user problems. Um, and finally, uh, zero knowledge proofs. Um, I think these are the coolest things in sliced bread. Uh, what it basically means for our purposes is that you can prove uh, the truth of a statement without revealing the underlying facts. So. You can say, uh, given the date of birth in your passport credential, you can prove that your age is between a certain range uh, or greater than or less than a certain number um, without revealing your exact date of birth. Um, and yet the uh, the verifier can still trust that, uh, that, that, it, that that is absolutely satisfied. Um, that proof of age example is given all the time, but it can be used for, uh, for a proof of income. It can be used for proving that you've got a degree from one of a certain set of universities without revealing which one it can be used for all kinds of really cool things um so i've, I've banged on a lot, a lot about what it is 
Um, hopefully, the benefits of that are slightly uh, self-explanatory, but in, in case we need to really go into it, for businesses, this means you don't have to over-collect and therefore be responsible for more data than is strictly necessary. Now, most privacy uh, regulations um, already place this burden on businesses, um, but they have to throw their hands up and say, well, but I need all this information uh, for fraud prevention or because uh, but because it was necessary to fulfill this transaction. Um, here, we give businesses a way to only collect um, just what is needed. Um, and for users, uh, we allow them to enjoy just the, the dignity of a less surveilled life and, and enjoy natural serendipity rather than having every moment be be profiled by uh, by, by unwanted interests. So um, I, I think this is a very important benefit, but I think we have to be clear eyed when we talk about um, which benefits and for who, because as we'll see in some of the examples, um, privacy may not always be perceived as relevant for businesses and we have to, we have to be careful about how we sell it. Um, control matters a great deal. So in this benefit, uh when i talk about control i mean that it is usually the user who can choose what they're sharing and with whom and that's because they are a full participant in the sharing of this information so uh this isn't being brokered behind the scenes uh, by some magic sign in button in the sky usually they are given the opportunity in some uh, mobile app or or some online console to actually explicitly approve the data that's being shared because those credentials live under their control and they are choosing to release them. Um, what that means is that a business can have uh, great confidence that they've actually gained uh, true informed consent for the data processing that they're about to perform. Um, and it means that they can have a fundamentally more user-centric information architecture where um, perhaps they they just store less data or they, they rely on being able to get data from the user so they, they don't need to store it all themselves. Um, I think, again, back to the original point, that helps people think differently about solving user problems than, than the traditional patterns they might have leaned on. Um, and for users, uh, it's not just about being able to give informed consent, it's also about being able to withhold it. Um, you know, being able to have control and uh, toggle on and off the attributes you want to reveal and things like that. Um, that, that may be something that only a small percentage of users uh, decide to act upon, but the fact that that option exists is profoundly important. Um, and I think it's often overlooked when we talk about consent as being kind of all or nothing. Security is uh, obviously an umbrella term, but the, the way security shows up um, distinct from authenticity and these other properties I've talked about uh, with SSI tech, um, is that you can fundamentally change the attack surface for uh, data breaches and, and associated liability because um, issuers and, and particularly relying parties for data um, don't necessarily have to store that data for any longer than they need it. It can reside uh, at rest with the user, with the individual, um, rather than in these giant silos. So if you think about instead of having one big database that's got everyone's information um, you basically peanut butter that out across the whole populace and everyone's only got the data that relates to them. Um, it introduces a different set of, uh, of of threats and risks. So that's why I say the user benefit is potentially reduced exposure. I mean, it does, it does rely on, uh, on, on the infrastructure that individual has providing adequate protections. And, and you know, we're, the technology is not super mature for that yet. So it's important to temper our expectations here. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, that is a very different proposition to uh, this juicy database with, with millions or tens or even hundreds of millions of, of people's information in it um, that we see advertised on the dark web uh, every single week. And uh, interoperability, which is distinct from, uh, distinct from the portability that we talked about uh, earlier ago, Interoperability speaks to the vendor independence angle here. So you could have almost everything we've talked about up to now um, if some one big company like, uh, like like Google, Microsoft, any of these people who uh, came along and said, okay, we're going to give you a system that has all of this. Um, but interoperability allows you to connect disparate systems using standards. And the SSI community has been very focused on standards from the very, very beginning. Um, so this means that people implementing uh, solutions that use SSI technology have a choice of vendors. And that's really important. That keeps pricing competitive. Um, it it uh, accelerates the pace of innovation. 
Um, it also means that uh, any any single uh, ecosystem, any single deployment, um, isn't limited just by uh, that the, the the direct connections it's got there, because every other standards compatible system can talk to it. So uh, a, a user can can rock up with a wallet from a different vendor, um, a credentials that were issued by a third vendor, and go and go and still transact with that system. And so it it's, it enables this uh, this portability that we talked about. Um, and for for individuals again, they they benefit from not having that that lock in. They can use those credentials uh, in the widest possible uh, ecosystem. And so, so that all sounds great, right? We should uh, go and give these benefits to as many people as we as we possibly should. Um, I would say yes, uh, but uh, number one, uh, don't try and give all the benefits to everybody all the time. Uh, and number two, uh, don't ignore the challenges. Um, and there are there are some very real ones when it comes to working with with SSI Tech. Um, so we'll go through these individually. Um, the the first, uh, um, perhaps most most politically sensitive one, um, is to point out that it is still relatively immature. Um, you know, the the DID spec uh, only became a, an actual W three C standard uh, last year. Um, it overcame uh, some quite strenuous objections from some entrenched players um, to, to do so. But um, the criticism levied against it was, look, there are 330 plus DID methods. Um, they all have different properties. How, how can this actually enable interoperability? And you know what? Choice is important, but there's there's some truth to that. You know, so, so one has to be mindful that um, while everybody in the space is working really hard towards uh making these standards really firm um we're we're not 100 percent of the way there yet um and i think i think it's important to be aware of that um the same is true for the verifiable credentials as well they've been a standard for longer um but there are uh, some incompatible uh, implementation differences uh, you, you can basically mix, mix and match encoding serialization formats and signature schemes um, and depending on the combination you pick uh, you get different combinations of those benefits that we talked about. Like not every feature is available um, in every technology uh, choice that you might make. And so that's not necessarily a bad thing. They all have pros and cons, um, but it means you need to be aware of them. Um, and it makes the decision to just just use SSI um, a bit difficult because uh, because you actually have to be mindful of uh, what the, the, the tool stack or the vendor that you're working with, what they actually support and what their, what their stance is on the standards. Um, and it's also true for the, the task, uh, trust task protocols. So there are uh, fundamentally different approaches, which in fairness uh, arose because they serve different types of use cases. So this is this is less about not invented here and more about just having different groups of users, um, but they, they don't work with each other particularly well at the moment. Um, so all of this is gonna come out in the wash. Um, so I'm not, I'm not worried about this for, for the sake of um, people making purchasing decisions today. Um, but it is just it is just important to bear in mind that it means that not all of these benefits are going to be available um, in every implementation. And that results in in the second challenge, which is that um, we have uh, new standards. We have loads of vendors, both both big and small. Um, and, you know, they're very numerous. Uh, many are quite new to the space. And the simple fact is that while they work very hard on uh, making things work together, there is limited technical interoperability, meaning you know I can literally get a get a dial tone from uh, from system A to system B, or I could get a credential from issuer A into wallet B and provide it to to relying party C. You know people can demo those things working uh, in a limited way. There's severely limited practical interoperability though. Like we we have few deployments of sufficient scale that the kinks have been. Uh, worked out. So it means that uh, no one has really proven that the benefits of portability and composability and things like that work outside individual ecosystems. Um, there's no reason they can't, uh, and everyone is, is very committed to that, but but we have not demonstrated that yet as, a, as an industry. And so, uh, again, that's not unrealistic given the stage you're at, but what it means is that um, if interoperability on that list of benefits is, is one of the most important for your particular use case, then you probably need to temper your expectations. Um, if it's something that can come in the fullness of time, then great, have at it. Like we can, we can just go. Um, 
the uh, the third challenge that I, I think it would be remiss not to bring up is that while you don't need uh, blockchain to do SSI, in fact, you know, a great a great many uh, a great many DID methods uh, don't use blockchain. Um, a great many do, and when you say words like self-sovereign or decentralized, people invariably think blockchain. Um, and of course, the whole whole Web three mo movement is is expressly uh, blockchain centric. Um, and that's uh, a lot of goodness comes out of that. I mean, the whole the whole movement to uh, to give individuals greater sovereignty of, of, of their data is is philosophically very strongly aligned with with much that the the blockchain community has. It's, it's not all number go up, folks. Um, but the truth is that a lot of businesses and, and governments uh, won't or can't touch uh, anything that looks, smells, or sounds like blockchain. And um, they may have regulatory concerns, uh, they may, you know, have ESG mandates that say they can't do proof of work, um, or they may just be spooked by how complex their technology sounds and things like that. Um, and so it it presents a challenge for product managers when, when talking about these technologies in a business audience, because um, people think blockchain and they sometimes think blockchain bad. And so um, this doesn't mean don't use any of the, the blockchain variants of, of DID methods, things like that. Um, many of them are uh, genuinely the, the best choice for your use case. Um, it means exercise caution uh, in how you talk about them because it's um, it, it, there, there are many sort of tripwires and red flags that, that you could set off with people. Um, and then uh, finally, you know, because this is all relatively new um, and because it's uh, it's not yet been deployed at scale. Um, it is reasonable to expect that uh, even though we understand and we don't like the risks and harms associated with today's way of doing identity, um, this very different way of doing identity um, has its own set of risks and harms. And, and you know, it, it is it is possible that in in some cases those those risks and harms may even be more severe. Um, you know, it, it is not hard to think of ways that uh, political, economic social, technological, environmental, uh, or legal uh, harms can be introduced with this new technology. Um, and so, again, this doesn't mean don't do it. Um, this means like be be mindful that just saying, oh, individuals can control the data and everything's going to be great um, is, a, is a very naive position to take. Um, and so uh, we need to acknowledge that, you know, actually uh, how this stuff plays out in society may be different to how it plays out in the lab. Um, some work has started both within the SSI community and Nikki Hitman led a piece of work at the uh, Trust of IP Foundation uh, to, to start a dialogue about that. Um, and also outside the SSI community, so um, Philip Sheldrake and others uh, have, have written extensively about, about where they perceive the risks and, and actually um, Sheldrake contributed a chapter to the, the SSI book. So you can, uh, you can certainly read that as well if you've, uh, if you've got that on your bookshelf. But uh, yeah, I think, I think this is important to be aware of as well. So I'm going to pause for a, a quick drink of water. But now that we've been through the uh, the benefits and how to talk about them and some of the challenges and what to be aware of, uh, I want to get practical and talk about how to actually apply some of these superpowers to uh, to real world use cases. So, <clears throat> uh, in terms of some practical tips, what we're going to go through is uh, how to think about the user problem. Um, that's basic product management. I'm sure all the product people on this call don't, don't need me to tell them how to do that. Um, prioritizing the benefits, uh, specifically these, these SSI benefits that we're talking about. Uh, we're going to talk about how to map the ecosystem and the flow of trust and of data and of economic value uh, between the actors. Uh, we'll talk about some of the trade-offs that you need to make um, and then uh, that the fact that because things are changing very quickly, uh, you need to plan for change, not a, not a, a big bang uh, launch. And, thing. and we'll do this uh, in the context of a real old example, which is my my favorite uh, SSI use case, which is a, a health worker staff passport. So um, again, every product manager knows to do this. Uh, you cannot be successful if you start from a desire to apply some technology for its own sake or a desire to solve only a business problem, you need to start with the user. So uh, that's especially important when we're SSI folks who uh, you know think of ourselves as, as being the user's champion and want to do everything in a user-centric way. Um, you have to, you just really have to be quite strict about this. And so 
Uh, when you've got a statement about the problem that's framed in terms of the user, um, you can then zoom out a bit and look for signs that uh, an SSI of solution might be relevant. So uh, is it an inherent, inherently fragmented or decentralized environment? Uh, are there uh, lots of entities that, that, that these users interact with um, that, that trust each other, but perhaps don't have any natural means to exchange data, things like that? Um, a, a decentralized system with portable high fidelity data uh, would solve those in the general case. And so that's usually a good sign that, that we can apply it. So in the case of the, the health worker passport, um, uh, a problem statement here in the UK, doctors. Uh, doctors uh, waste 100,000 clinical days per year uh, just waiting to be allowed to work at a new location. Um, that's despite uh, the NHS being uh, the largest employer in, in the country and, and one of the largest in the world. Um, yeah, it is it is very difficult for them to move staff uh, between hospitals because uh, there's no there's no common system there. So the identity of the of the health worker, their qualifications, their training, their work history, they all have to get verified manually before that person is allowed to go and work. And uh, junior doctors rotate many times uh, between hospitals during their training, uh, and people take locum shifts, all this kind of stuff. Um, so. Uh, does that smell like an SSI use case? I think so. It's inherently fragmented. There's a million staff, 200 trusts, lots of movement. Um, and uh, do they trust each other but have no means to exchange data? Well, yes. The NHS has one standard for, uh, for, for, for what it means to be allowed to, uh, to practice, but there's no one uh, database of, of all of these identity qualifications training that everyone can just plug into. Um, and so, this is why uh, a self-sovereign or a decentralized identity solution looks like it, it ought to be a good fit. So when thinking through the benefits, um, we can start with a, a straw man uh, of a solution um, and then look at that list of benefits and say, OK, well, of these, <clears throat> which ones are the most relevant? Um, and that's really what the solution needs to be centered around. You, you don't need to uh, force every type of benefit uh, into a particular use case. Uh, and in fact, if if the benefits are marginal, you don't need to do SSI. Like there will be other user problems that you'll come across in your product management career that might be better suited. For. And this this next project you happen to land on doesn't have to be the one where you get to flex these amazing new uh, DID and, and VC skills that you've learned about today. So uh, I think I think it's very important to to be able to just take a pass as well if it's if it's not going to be a successful fit. Um, but in the case of the, the health worker staff passport, uh, it's a very good fit. So the, the proposed solution is that instead of building some giant database in the sky, um, the workers themselves get a, uh, a digital wallet that uh, lives on their, their personal mobile device that contains credentials for the identity, the qualifications, the training, and the work history. And then the trusts, which could be a hospital, clinic, etc. Um, uh, and later on, the uh, other relevant bodies, um, we'll come to that in a moment, um, we equip those to be able to uh, issue and verify these credentials. And so uh, when you think about the health workers moving around between all those sites, uh, they can basically just obtain credential at site A, go and use it at site B. Um, and that's uh, that without those two sites needing to integrate with each other. Um, that, when you look through the benefits, uh, means that portability leaps out at you as the main benefit. The main reason to reach for SSI in this case um, is that allowing the trust to rely on each other's records, um, which they've received via the user rather than via some integration, that is what unlocks the ability to, to potentially radically reduce those, those 100,000 wasted days. Uh, authenticity, though, is also absolutely critical. If there was any doubt that the person presenting uh, this, uh, this credential wasn't a real doctor, um, then that would be catastrophic. The doctors are some of the most uh, trusted individuals uh, in in modern society, um, and it would be it would be catastrophic if we did anything to, to to weaken that. And so, the fact that you can move this data around via the individual but still have absolute confidence in it, uh, that's what allows this use case to to really flourish. Um, the composability, uh, the ability to combine attributes from different credentials, um, that's that's highly beneficial. And when we when we work through the ecosystem mapping example, um, you'll see why. Uh, why I make that claim, but I, I don't think it's essential. Um, I think you could you could still deliver quite a useful uh, quite a useful health worker passport uh, with just a single monolithic credential if if you had to.
Um, privacy is always preferable, um, but a lot of these workplace use cases um, don't don't strictly require it. Um, you know, the fact is that uh, the data processing that's happening is uh, is necessary. There's a, a legitimate interest in, in collecting and using that data. Um, most of that data originated in the workplace anyway. So um, you know, we're not we're not actually meaningfully eroding that user's privacy. Um, so if these credentials were to be used outside of this use case, um, then it would certainly make much more sense. And so that's why I say it's always preferable, but I, you know, it's not one of the reasons to choose SSI in this case. Um, same same thing really for, for control. I, I, I say control is neutral here because it is it is beneficial. It means that the uh, the workers themselves are able to do some of the uh, busy work of of going around and gathering these credentials that will allow them to then go and go and work at their ne next location. That shifts some of that burden uh, from the business to the user, and so in that way, um, the fact that the user has control, I think, actually is uh, is a benefit and a reason to choose SSI. Uh, security, obviously, very important, um, but you know, not meaningfully improved in this case. The fact that the data uh, lives on the individual's phone uh, rather than in some database. Uh, doesn't massively change the uh, the sort of risk profile as far as the uh, the NHS is concerned here, um, but interoperability is is crucial. Um, you know, it's a diverse IT environment um, across across the health sector here. Um, being able to have a choice of vendors uh, is really important. A just to just to make it work, and B to drive uh, competitive pricing so that more funds can go into actually helping patients. So. So we look at that list of, of um, seven possible benefits. We come up with three really strong ones and two marginal ones. Um, and I think that's a good reason to, to feel confident that, that using uh, verifiable credentials and DIDs to tackle this problem makes sense. And so then, uh, then you can go and uh, actually map out the ecosystem and start thinking about <clears throat> how you want to solve the problem. Now, we're going to spend a bit of time on this because um, I think this is a, a really helpful way to frame the problem, and I think that it's something that is is relatively unique to uh, SSI use cases, not not something that um, that, that we often do in, in other walks of, of product management. Um, and so, what we'll do is we're going to use a template to uh, name the the actors and the, uh, the the credentials and the flows that these these things used to move around. Uh, it'll help us identify what data is needed, and so we can ask ourselves the question of well where do we get that data which issues do we need what systems do we need to connect to um it helps you think through what are the touch points like where does the user interact what what journeys need to be built there um and uh, and also how how trust is established like just the fact that i have some data doesn't mean i could necessarily uh, rely on it so um it doesn't doesn't answer all those questions but by um by pinning the use case down in this format um, it actually gives you, I think, a really good way to to go and explore the edges of, of the scenario and come up with those answers. So, so we start with the with a blank canvas like this. Uh, we've got uh, issues on the left um, and credentials. You've got the holders; those are typically the individuals, but but not necessarily. Um, there's the people who who have the the, the, the credentials about themselves. Um, presentations or, or proofs. That's uh, that's what it is that that holder is, is proving about themselves and the verifier is the, is the relying party. Um, the convener shown there at the bottom, um, these are the people that make it possible for issuers and verifiers to trust each other. So these might be uh, regulators, um, governance bodies, uh, or just, um, just service providers if it's a more closed ecosystem. Um, but these, this is uh, kind of what, what helps to, to bring it all together. And so uh, credentials and data flow from left to right um, issuers issue credentials to holders, holders present presentations to verifiers. That's the kind of how to read this. Um, but sort of trust flows uh, flows by the middle. The, the verifiers and issuers uh, mutually trust the conveners and so are able to form transitive trust with the holder because of that. So it's a bit daunting to just look at those, uh, those six boxes and think, well, how on earth to, to fill them out. Um, I, I propose a sequence that um, that that is helpful. Uh, you don't have to do it this way. Um, in fact, I've seen I've seen other people uh, propose um, kind of uh, verifiable credential canvases that, um, that that start the other way uh, to, to the way I like to do it. So <clears throat> so so your mileage may vary, but um, I always start with the with the user, so the holder. Uh, I think if you don't start there, it's it's hard to, to 
call what you're doing product management really um so start start with the individual figure out who it is um but then uh then you start with start with the verifier right so what uh what actually who, who are the entities um and what data uh, are they requiring so then you go next to presentations what is it that the holder is proving to the verifier um once you've mapped that out you can start thinking about okay well where might i get that data from so you can start listing out who your issuers might be um then you can work through all right well what data might those issues have available what credentials might we have um, and then finally once you've got that mapped out you can say well who who might be the people that can bring this together what 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 common uh, trust authorities could convene this ecosystem so I, I typically do conveners last and the sorts of questions to ask yourself uh, as, as you go through here um uh, this, this is basically what i was saying on the previous slide actually but um, it's not an exhaustive list of questions, but, but basically, if you uh, if you start with a with a simple visual representation, just check off that you've actually uh, thought through not uh, not just you know who requires proof, but how can they get it? Who do they trust? These kind of questions actually help you uh, find the edges on here. So uh, there's just a bunch of grey boxes uh, where it really comes to life is if we if we do an example. So we're going to walk through this uh, in the context of that uh, that health worker passport. So. First of all, <clears throat> we know that the health worker is the, the primary user, the holder here. So that was easy. We put the, put the health worker in there. Um, and what they need to verify is the right to work that a, uh, sorry, sorry, the hospital HR team needs to verify the right to work that a health worker has. So, so this right hand flow is very easy to do. And you'll note that at this point, I'm not getting specific about exactly what fields are in here and what does a right to work look like, but um, I know that by the time I'm finished, there'll be, excuse me, there'll be a presentation called Right to Work. Uh, it will come from the holder's digital wallet and it will be received and verified by the verifier. So I draw that out here um, and that, that helps me uh, help to understand what to do next, which think about, okay, well, where, where can I get that data from? So uh, <clears throat> hospital HR team, uh, hospital A's HR team, uh, if the doctor is moving from hospital A to hospital B, uh, has that data already because they previously onboarded uh, this this health worker. So the uh, the identity, the qualifications, the training history, all of that that lives in their system, uh, that can be turned into credentials uh, and that can be issued to the health worker. And so uh, we can actually pause here and say, well, hold on, have we, have we done it? Um, and yeah, for, for an MVP, um, this actually is what the first version of the the UK's uh, NHS digital staff passport looked like. Um, so they they simply allowed uh, one NHS trust to to issue uh, a, a super set of credentials, basically that uh, another another could verify. Um, and so the only convener you needed was uh, was was the NHS themselves. I mean, you had this very basic uh, flow from from right to left here. Um, so we're going to take this to the next step though which is to say all right well maybe that works for an mvp but um how how can we actually scale this ecosystem a bit to do that i think we need to think is is hospital H, is hospital hr really the best source of, of identity data is it really the best source of qualification data <clears throat> it's all secondhand information for them and to make this really scale uh, it would be better to get those from uh, from closer to the source so so there's a variant of this uh, plan for the future where you can say well actually i want universities to be able to issue qualification credentials directly um i'd want specialized identity verification providers to be able to do the identity proofing bit of this and you know scanner scan a passport or a driver's license do biometric matching do all that cool stuff um and uh training providers of, of which there are probably several in this ecosystem um they ought to be issuing the the training credentials directly uh, rather than having uh, them issued on paper and then the HR department has to has to issue them. So if we think about what is the end state for this ecosystem, um, it looks a lot more like this. Um, and it's not it's not radically more complicated. Um, we've introduced another uh, relevant entity in the in the convenience box, which is the, the General Medical Council um, that <coughs> excuse me, um, that is because it's important to recognize that, that you know, we've moved outside of the the bounded context of, of just of just the uh, the NHS and, and as an employer here, and we're looking at the the wider industry, including uh, training and, and qualifications and, and so forth. So, um, but the good thing is there is there is strong mutual trust between uh, between all these parties. 
Um, when we've got a flow like this, uh, the next thing that happened actually in the uh, in, in the real world uh, use case here was that the question was asked: Well, if we've got uh, if we've got health workers with digital wallets and credentials in them, um, as well as the ability to prove their right to work, can we can we use the system to give them access to uh, to clinical IT systems, for example? Um, and turns out it's actually it's actually very easy. So you could just add on to this. The fact that well okay i want the hospital it system to be a verifier um they need a presentation which is the the right to log in that, that also comes from the holder um and what's uh, what's that based on well it's based on uh, a different hospital it department issuing uh, uh some it permissions or it access credential um it all flows via the wallet um but again this way of uh, of modeling the data flow and the, and the trust flow is so different to if you if you were doing this in the uh, in the traditional way and you just literally drew your big permissions database in there and you have the users kind of hanging off it rather than here we've got the user at the center we're imagining the data kind of flowing via them i think it gives you a great deal more more flexibility in terms of how you uh, how you think about the use case um and so if we if we say this is our design end state I mean, we might ship the mvp first but this is this is what we envisage as a, as a fully fledged health worker passport now we can say, okay, what data specifically would I need to enable this? Um, what, where might I find that data in internal systems and, and things like that? So then you can expand this out and you can say, all right, well, my, my right to work, <clears throat> I'm gonna need the doctor's name, I'm gonna need uh, a visual likeness, and I need to know, do they have the, the medical qualification required for the placement they're being asked to do? Do they have the required training to work in this facility? Those are basically the questions I need to ask. Um, and uh, if we if we work back through the flow, it's reasonable to assume that, that the name and the photograph we could get from an identity credential. The uh, the question of whether or not the uh, medical qualification is sufficient uh, would come from that that university uh, qual issued qualification credential. Um, I've, I've posed that here in the form of a, of a zero knowledge proof. It, it might be that um, for record keeping purposes, they would need the whole qualification uh, and all, all, that, all that credential details. But um, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, being able to ask the question, uh, hey, does this, does this health worker have a qualification that meets the standards and just get back a yes, no answer using that, that zero knowledge proof benefit that we talked about earlier. Uh, and same thing for the same thing for the training. Um, you could just basically say, uh, if you can describe what the requirement is, um, then you could just get a presentation that gives you proof that you've met that requirement without sharing the entire training history of the of the worker. Um, and so, this is what a uh, a relatively simple uh, example of a of a fully filled out canvas would look like. Um, I uh, you'll be have access to this presentation um, after the uh, after this episode goes up. So feel free to, uh, to to let me know how you get on. Actually, like download the the blank version, um, map out some of the the use cases that you're working on, and, and see if it helps you um, think about uh, think about how to actually design it and think about where the where the edges are. Because uh, I know this is something I've used with with a couple of the uh, the clients that I'm working with, and it's it's been found quite useful. So once we've got our our pretty map. Um, that unfortunately is not the end of the the, the job. Uh, at that point, now we need to go and answer the the more uh, traditional questions of all right. Well, how do I get that data? What integration points are there? Uh, what standards are required? You know, can I just uh, can I just format this data however I like, or actually um, are there well established ways to uh, to push this data into other systems that I need to be mindful of while I'm uh, while I'm designing this? Um, which of the identities don't necessarily have an existing relationship that I, I need to make sure that I've got aligned incentives I need to make sure that I've provided the right governance um, and uh, what reasons are there that it might not work uh, so you know there could well be uh, regulatory challenges uh, you know both both real and imagined uh, privacy often gets gets away and security get get waved around a lot as reasons why you couldn't possibly ever release the data outside the estate um, you know as as product people working in SSI we spend a lot of time uh, really explaining to people why that benefit of portability, that benefit of authenticity, why that works and why that lets you think differently uh, about these problems. But but some of the gatekeepers you run into um, may well have very entrenched ways of thinking about this. And so, uh, so there might be quite a lot of work to do to, to overcome that. 
and then you've got to make some decisions so think back to uh to what we said about the state of the industry and some of the challenges well uh, having ranked the benefits um you now have to choose uh of the available sort of technology families and, and standards groups and vendors <clears throat> which ones are available to me uh given the benefits that i know have to show up in my uh in my particular solution and so uh you know today that is uh that is not a massively straightforward choice um, i'm confident that in a couple of years uh most vendors will support most flavors of everything and, and we'll have really really good uh interoperability across the across the industry but for today um unfortunately as a product person you do need to be cognizant of some of those technical trade-offs because it will it will show up in how you craft your requirements um you also need to think about uh what you build versus what you what you buy in you know if uh if you want ultimate control then then probably you need to be working with uh some of the open source frameworks and actually building some of this tooling yourself uh but to do that will require uh climbing quite a steep learning curve um if if not if you're really you know you're confident that there's a vendor out there that can deliver the benefits that matter for your use case i strongly encourage you just to work with that vendor there is no point reinventing the wheel on this stuff um there's i don't believe there's going to be uh several hundred um great companies that, that implement their own ssi stuff just like just like nobody implements their own uh, authentication stack today um, unless you're really doing something novel, uh, I would encourage you to, to, to work with a vendor on this stuff. One of the fundamental choices you will face, though, is um, how, how important custody or sort of true self-sovereignty is to the use case, both, both now and in the future. Um, I say this because obviously all things being equal, you know, it's great to make everyone more, more sovereign over their data. Um, but it's not always practical, particularly given the state of the tooling today. So you've really got to think through how much responsibility is it reasonable to give the user. Um, in the case of a, of a health worker, uh, proving that they are uh, qualified and, and suitable to, to go and do their job on a given day, uh, I would argue it's very reasonable. Um, that, that person is, is thinking about this all the time. They're, they're always adding to their training. It's a, it's, it's a regular touch point in their professional life. Um, but you know, for, should an, an individual hold the uh, the verifiable credential that proves that they're the legal owner of their home, um, that's some, uh, something that they may only need to find and use again uh, when they sell that home in, in a decade's time. And goodness knows what will have happened to that, that mobile device in the meantime. I'd say probably not, right? So uh, there are there are different degrees of, of centralization and of, of self sovereignty that are appropriate for different use cases and. It's important not to be dogmatic about this. It's really important to be focused on the actual user problem and, and what benefits you're, uh, you're trying to bring. And then finally, uh, you've got to think through the trust network. So um, what I mean by that is, you know, in, the, in the, the example we just went through, it's pretty easy because <clears throat> there was already uh, a strong federation of trust, lots of bodies actually that those, uh, those different uh hospitals and, and clinics are, are mutual members of so it's it's easy relatively speaking to think about how you get them to trust each other um that is not necessarily true when you start thinking about uh more more complex or diverse ecosystems um, and so you will have to think about uh how are you going to make that work uh, are you going to join an existing uh group or are you going to create your own and my strong advice to you is uh start as simply as you possibly can um and so ideally join an existing one or if you're going to create one make it incredibly small um, and then evolve um, the biggest the biggest possible benefit out of self-sovereign identity is is this portability is this ability to have all of the different touch points in your you know personal professional civic life um, and be able to to leverage your reputation across all of these things i i, I really firmly believe that um, but we do not get there uh, in one big jump. We get there with a lot of incremental steps. And so as you build your use case, you've probably imagined all the different uh, all the different actors, all the different credentials, you know, like that big colorful version of the, the ecosystem app we just went through. Um, but notice that we started with an MVP, which had uh, basically the same issuer as the, as, as the relying party, as the verifier. Um, that is great best practice, honestly, like having the smallest number of actors 
uh, that you possibly can and having an approach to governance that that evolves as you um, as you actually learn from from deployment i think is the the way to get success um, unfortunately i've seen a number of ssi projects that uh, were very very worthy but very very ambitious uh, and and tried to start with a bit of a big bang um, and and they really struggled because it was too many actors to corral uh, around a, a framework that was a bit too fragile technology that was immature, incentives that weren't perfectly aligned, um, and the thing never got off the ground. Whereas if they'd started with a small proof of value that uh, kept the user front and center, and then built from there, um, they probably would have had uh, a lot more success. And so that obviously applies to every kind of product management, not just self-sovereign identity product management, but with SSI, we're often thinking about ecosystems and diversity and portability so so we tend to find ourselves uh facing this trade-off perhaps more than, than some of our other colleagues so um so i really want to drive that point home I, I think it's very important to be to be rigorous about that um i also think you can consider uh progressive decentralization and, and by that i mean um you know it, it's not uh, i'm not trying to mince words there i i, I mean that you know, decentralization is obviously uh, a very noble goal, and it might be it might be the only way that you manifest some of the benefits that we talked about earlier. Um, but it it may be uh, it may be a lot to do that in the very first version of the product. Uh, it might make sense to start with something that has a few uh, points of centralization in it that uh, just let you make sure that you're delivering the user benefit, kind of no matter what's happening at the technology layer. Um, but you've designed in appropriate breakpoints where you can uh, decentralize things in future so an example of that would be uh, having uh, the user credentials uh, stored in a, uh, uh, in a in a cloud custodial wallet for example in the beginning that users can access just using a conventional web interface um, and then power users can get a wallet and and export that onto their mobile device um, and and look after that themselves and then as technology matures, as the use cases get better understood, as users get more uh, upskilled, perhaps more and more people can, can go down that path. Um, but you know, if you start requiring everybody to install your app and everybody write down a 12 word mnemonic seed phrase and things like that, um, you're gonna really struggle in a lot of scenarios. So I, again, I would urge you to, to think about a path to the, uh, the end destination rather than uh, trying to get there in, in one, big, uh, one big loop. So that's a lot about how uh, how uh, SSI can apply to to product management and how uh, folks can use that to go and tackle the um, the user problems that they're facing. Um, I'm going to spend considerably less time uh, telling uh, my my SSI friends uh, how to do product management because uh, I think this is all stuff that, that people have learned before. Um, instead, I just want to focus on uh, the bits which I think. Uh, bear repeating, frankly, because uh, they they could uh, they could really do with um, being a bit more conspicuous in, in some of the work that's, that's seen out there in the industry. Um, so you know, look, there's a million different definitions of of what a what a product manager is. I'm I'm going to come out uh, obnoxiously strongly opinionated on this. Uh, I think your job, like the number one role uh, of a of a of a product manager, is to advocate for the user. Um, you're not advocating for SSI. Uh, you're advocating for the user, and that's that's tough because this stuff is exciting, and like we we want to bring about this big societal change, and you know really have an impact. That's that's all good. Um, but if we're not uh, if we're not delivering impact for the user, then we never get there, uh, and, we, and we haven't done our job. So the the way to get there is by delivering value for the user. Um, you also have to do all those other uh, things that product managers do, like write requirements create a roadmap, sell that to your higher ups, uh, develop a credible go-to-market plan, always be learning. Um, and if it turns out in the, uh, in, in the process of doing all those that you go through that rubric earlier and you find that, yeah, like this, this problem I'm working on uh, has some benefits that can, can be, be best delivered by an SSI enabled solution. Awesome. That's great. If not, don't force it. Like your next project or your next project probably, uh, probably will present that opportunity. The other thing you remember is that nobody wants SSI. Like we, we, SSI PMs, we want SSI. We know about it. We think that's cool. Um, but but the truth is that uh, nobody out there in the real world um, knows that they want it uh, at, at the moment. Um, and, and even if they did, uh, SSI 
it's not a thing that you can give to someone you can't you can't magically with any any product, uh single or, or collective just make someone sovereign over their data this is this is a journey this is uh, i actually think ssi is, is a an emergent property of a bunch of use cases and a bunch of products out there in the market um that happen to all work together because they're using these standards and, and what you end up with when you've got enough of them uh is this this sort of highly liquid market for, for trust and for data um it doesn't happen overnight and it's certainly not something that, that, that you or any pm is going to just give to a user um so we should we should try and rid ourselves of uh of that goal um <clears throat> Most people you work with uh, will be blissfully unaware of SSI. We we shouldn't assume that people know what it is and, and that they care about it. And so, so that's why uh, that's why I propose some some ways to frame it in terms of benefits. And uh, I would encourage you to, to talk about it that way. Um, and I think to remember that it's not uh, it's not an end unto itself. Like it's uh, it, it's important, but but what we're here to do is use it to deliver uh, value for for users. And if we can frame that value in terms of the specific benefits um, and we get there using SSI, I think that's uh, that's much better than starting with the goal of self-sovereignty and trying to figure out how to back every project and every use case into it. Um, and finally, I'll just say, if you're, if you're teaching, you're losing. Like a lot of people talk about how uh, we need to uh, get better at educating, we need to uh, rename the industry, SSI, decentralized identity, ID tech, Web5. You know, all those things might help, but if we're teaching, we're losing. Like fundamentally, these benefits have to stand on their own merits, and if they're good enough, people will follow themselves, no matter what we call it, uh, to, to adopt this stuff. And so that, if, if, if we keep that in mind, I think we'll have, we'll have a lot more success. Um, Prioritization is super important. Like we know this, a lot of product managers' job is, is perceived to be uh, all about just prioritizing the backlog. But um, it's especially important, uh, I think, when you've again got got this uh, this way of seeing the world through these uh, graph glasses, as uh, as John and Reed calls them, where you've got this uh, this very decentralized view. And so um, it's important to start with the user, then the solution, then the value proposition, then the benefits of SSI. Um, and you can plan uh, a roadmap to get to that end destination rather than a rather than a big bang. Um, and this this is where I run into a particular bugbear of mine. People talk a lot about the the chicken and egg problem of SSI or the cold start problem of SSI. Um, I I don't think it applies. I, I I think this idea that you know what what comes first, like the 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 users or the issuers or the verifiers, things like that. Um, it's it's a it's a, it's an artificially SSI centric lens uh, that people put on is almost as an excuse to avoid tackling the the fact that like you're not solving a business problem. Like if you solve a business problem, there is no there is no chicken and egg. Like you you will deliver value, and if you keep delivering value, um, then you get your flywheel spinning. Um, if if you need uh, a whole bunch of chickens before you can have eggs, uh, you've got a problem, and you framed your problem wrong. And so. Uh, whenever we find ourselves using this as a uh, as an excuse, uh, I think we need to look really hard at ourselves and actually say, well, hold on, um, there needs to be a different framing here rather than just saying, oh, well, I'll come back when uh, when a couple million more people have, have wallets on their phones. Um, and yeah, then this this one, uh, I wanted to reference one of my favorite uh, XKCD comics, uh, just to remind us all uh, not to reinvent the wheel. Um, a lot of folks in SSI are there because the tech is really cool, super interesting. Uh, it's, it's certainly one of the things I find most exciting about it. Um, but uh, you know, there's there's a lot of good work already. I'm not saying it's perfect, um, but the last thing we need is is yet another new approach or yet another new standard or yet another new standards body. Even um, I think the industry will will move a lot further, a lot faster. Uh, if we start working with what's already there um, and uh, and actually build on that and deliver some value uh, rather than staying in, in standards land, uh, just talking about doing so. Um, and my final point uh, is that none of this none of this will work um, if there isn't a viable business model. And yes, uh, because we are changing the way that that trust and information flows, um, we're also potentially changing the way that economic value flows. Um, and that was conspicuously absent from the, the ecosystem map. There's a 
there's another version of that that maybe we can cover uh, in another presentation that um, that talks through that. But basically, um, it, it might change business models. It might not, but you certainly can't overlook it because we are uh, we are removing uh, certain uh, entrenched date um, uh, toll keepers and gatekeepers from uh, from some of these information flows. And so, uh, so you, you can't just bring those same assumptions into solving these problems. But again, if you start with who receives the value. Um, you will be able to find an appropriate business model there. Um, if you look at the usability and privacy trade-offs of different business models, um, that will often be a really helpful guide. Uh, people talk about how um, they could just implement, uh, you know, crypto tokens so that they, a verifier can pay an issuer for a credential, things like that. That may well be uh, a really compelling use case but it's gonna massively implement your usability if suddenly every actor needs to have a, a, a crypto wallet as well as a credential wallet. Um, you might say, well, I don't need that because my uh, my ecosystem convener can just run billing for the whole ecosystem. That's very, very convenient, um, but it has privacy trade-offs, right? There, are, If you run a, a hub in there, you can say it's just for, just for billing, I don't see any of the data, but you see metadata, right? You see who's transacting about what and so on and so forth. And so um, that might be fine, but it might not. So. As you think through the business models uh, that are available to you, um, definitely bear both the, the usability and the privacy in mind when you do that. Um, and then finally, just beware that um, people will actively fight this. Like you, you, you will, you will run into people whose uh, whose business this threatens, um, whose twenty year career doing things the other way this threatens, um, and uh, even though. Uh, it might be better for the organization they represent or better for society as a whole for them to get on board. Um, their personal or their kind of local incentives uh, might be strongly opposed to it. Um, and that, uh, as a product manager, you've really got to remember that you're you're selling, you're selling to all your stakeholders all the time. And it's it's critical that you understand what motivates these people. And they, they might not all be uh, necessarily acting in the collective self-interest when they when they look at these problems. So that's a lot of James's strongly held opinions about uh, how to how to go do this. Um, I uh, I hope that hasn't come across as uh, as, as as too uh, too obnoxious, Alex. But uh, but you anyway, know, I, I found when I sat down to make this presentation that I, I had I had quite a lot to say because I, I I I really care. I think I think this stuff is is super exciting, and I I want to see more SI products get get built. So the the lasting thought is is simply you know I, I believe that uh, if, if we uh, SSI practitioners can get out there in the wider PM community and and teach folks that, that actually you can have portable high fidelity data, um, that that will allow people to go solve problems in a, in a really exciting and powerful new way. Um, and so if, if any of this stuff helps people uh, apply uh, SSI with a bit more confidence, um, then I'll consider it, I'll consider it a job done. But uh, you know, it's a shame we're not doing this live because it would have been great to get uh, get folks feedback. But uh, you can find me, James underscore Monaghan, on uh, on Twitter uh, or, uh, you know, um, any any of the other usual channels. And it would be great to uh, to let me know how you get on. So uh, thank you very much for, for watching. If you did make it through the, the whole hour of this, um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, James. I think this is amazing. I think it's a great start um, um, to start a new season for us as I meet up. I, I noted down some questions just because I think it would be cool. I mean, I think everyone can ping um, James and add his hashtag there, at James Monaghan. James Monaghan. Um, but I mean, you've been in the space now for what, six, seven, eight years at least, right? Yeah, well, uh, doing, doing SSI since 2016. Yeah. yeah, and then and then yeah, doing identity. Uh, yeah, since 2012. So yeah, so only SSI. That's that's what I remembered yeah, you yeah, because yeah. I, I joined you like a year after you you were on the SSI space. That's that right, yeah. and, I okay. mean, a couple of questions that people might have, and I'm, I'm sure they will have many more questions, but hopefully they will just tag you in Twitter, um, and 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 ask those. Um, what what happened to this very cool use case? I remember this because it has it has been spoken about with the NHS, right? Um, the MVP. I mean, it sounds like a no brainer that would be great for the UK to have it. Uh, what are the next steps there? 
Yeah, so so I'm I'm happy to say that's that's live in I forget the exact count, but I know it's well over a hundred uh, locations. Um, so so yeah, that that is uh, that is that is a real thing, um, and it's it's a thing of beauty, honestly. Like because it is uh, it is multi vendors. I mean, gosh, that that project has uh, has has uh, Evidim, uh, Candatis, Microsoft, True. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of vendors working together uh to to make that work um it's in as i said you know well over 100 uh locations there's there's lo loads and loads of uh of um, health workers that use it um and uh and it's kind of moving down that path from the the mvp where you've just got uh you know hospital a uh issuing credential to the to the the doctor that the hospital b can rely on um to bringing in those other uh, other actors and, and saying well actually we could outsource the identity piece over here and the uh, the academic training piece over here and the professional training piece over here and so forth um and so so it is it is making its way down that uh down that line which is really good and then in the in the show notes uh after this we can we can put a link actually where folks can uh, can go and have a look at that i don't have the url handy but um uh but yeah it's 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 my favorite use case not just because it's like so beautifully made for uh, for, for this technology, um, but uh, because it's actually working in delivering delivering meaningful impact. No, absolutely. Um, you also mentioned um, blockchains and the resistance. I think this resistance in the, I don't know, SSI permissioned world has existed always. I've always yeah. encountered it. Um, um, but there's also a shift because, I mean, for a long time, SSI didn't really know much about, about blockchains i mean what i mean with blockchains or the blockchain world is i like i mean more like the crypto world yeah um, and at, at the same time the crypto world didn't care much or wasn't as interested in 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 in, in ssi i mean i think maybe the, one of the exceptions at, at a time when we were working together was maybe uport because they were part of yeah. consensus and they were like really close to 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 both worlds um but 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 that's that's about it um, we're seeing a shift, and uh, we will invite people in the future as we discussed, right? Um, that are coming up in the crypto space, trying to do identity SSI. Um, what is your view? I mean, what, what has been shifting? What 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 is coming up so that this has been opening up the whole concept of SSI in the crypto space? Yeah, yeah. Well, so so I mean, you, you you're absolutely right. I mean, I think people are thinking about it a lot more. And what's been what's been really interesting is there's the uh, there's kind of the the what I'd call the natively Web three use cases. So the things that are still uh, kind of culturally from that world. So a lot of that is uh, you know proof of um, proof of membership of a particular community or, or tribe, uh, proof of participating in an airdrop, like proof of having one of the first you know N uh, NFTs and things like that. Uh, a lot of that is used to get get access to discord servers and to access merch and things like that so there's, there's a whole lot of like natively web3 uh, identity use cases that are super cool um there's also these sort of crossover use cases where um, a number of these DeFi projects uh, are choosing to be you know lightly regulated or like aligned with regulations uh even though uh, even though there may not be formal oversight of them at this point um you know they're, they're laying the rails to be able to do um kind of like, like kyc and things like that um and so so a lot of that stuff is 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 borrowing uh from from that world as well so you've got you know you you've got lots and lots of projects that uh that have everything from you know uh, nfts and soulbound tokens that, that sort of represent your identity uh, those are a bit of a blunt instrument when it comes to all of those benefits i was i was talking about earlier on like they they can manifest a, a very small number of those but they but they have lots of other uh, attributes that, that weren't relevant for, for today's talk um, all the way through to uh, projects in the in the blockchain space that are using you know off-chain verifiable credentials and DIDs like uh, like the SSI community does, and so um, it's been it's been really really cool to to see that convergence. Um, and you know now uh, there's the emergence of some projects which uh, are combining like the best of both worlds. So uh, there are, there are projects where you you can basically choose: do you want your uh, do you want your attributes in a in a credential or an NFT or both? Um, there's projects which allow you to uh, to use your off-chain credentials to make proofs on-chain. Um, so, you know, again, you, using zero knowledge, uh, you can actually still prove the things you need to know uh, about yourself to uh, to an on-chain uh, smart contract and things like that. So, um, the pace of innovation is amazing, and you know, the SSI community is is tiny. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's 
probably a hundred startups now, things like that, a few hundred people. It's not, it's not super tiny. Um, it's not very well funded. I mean, yes, some of those individuals work for Microsoft and what have you, but you know, compared to the vast sums of money that uh, that sort of the the, the DeFi space um, has available to it, um, you know, that's leading to an explosion in research around you know practical applications of zero knowledge cryptography and things like that. So, um, I think you know you, you you've been on this uh, Alex since the very beginning, but I think building those bridges is is so important because, like, frankly, the the, the blockchain centric community uh, is is incredibly well funded. They're moving really, really quickly. Um, and again, like many of them haven't heard about this stuff and would use it if only they knew. So uh, so SSI folks need to uh, you know need to get even more out of their their own ecosystem and and start start building those bridges, I would say. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, I mean, you, you as you were going through the concepts, you know, like the different concepts of portability, uh, interoperability. I mean, all those concepts are super familiar. Like, I mean, we've been talking about them, I mean, everyone here for ages, but of course, the way you provided with all the context of experience and having tried so many things and seeing what works, what doesn't work, and just like providing framework is, is really good. But it, to some extent, it also sounds like discouraging because like, look, we just keep on hearing about, I think same subjects, right? It's like, uh, all the standard bodies, all those, everyone wants to have the standards and, and they're not interoperable and which then defeats the whole purpose. Yeah. And we want all those different things, but we, we spoke about this, like without this level of insight that you're providing, that has been a subject for a long time, right? What, 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 what needs to happen? What, how do you see this unfolding? Is it like, will it continue like unfolding slowly? Or would it be like a tipping point where these things come together faster? Yeah. Well, so, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think that we're past the the proof of concept stage now. So I think I think the technology is mature enough that you can do useful things with it. I mean, you know, when when I joined Evanim, we had uh, a command line demo that, that showed that the cryptography worked and that it was like it was technically possible to do these things. But that was, you know, that was a long way from from having a having a useful, uh, useful app. And so, of course, you know, as uh, as running the product team there, one of the first things we did was was build build an app that people could use and build web pages and you know let, let people touch the technology things like that. Um, you know we, we we've now got to the point where yeah it's not perfect but you know these things basically work and they work with each other and these benefits like they're actually available. You can go build them into products now. Um, and so so I think uh, I think that has only happened though really in the last couple of years and and because of what I said about how. You know, the SSI community is mostly focused on identity use cases, and the rest of the world doesn't know about SSI. You know, there hasn't been this outflowing of this this now quite decent technology into wide industry. I I think that'll happen. I think that's that's a matter of time. Um, you know, it, it's very much more in a mainstream agenda now. You know, it's it's a it's a Gartner um, it's a hot topic, uh, very much so uh, at the moment. And a lot of the analysts uh, are talking about how. This this very much needs to be on people's people's agenda, and so you know, big companies are looking at it. Uh, the Web three space is looking at it, um, but then the other thing I think is is again just a degree of degree of pragmatism is is I think starting to break out. You know, there's been so much hand wringing about oh why don't we have adoption? How do we solve chicken egg? Um, you know, it's because it's because people are going for the big complicated use cases, and if 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 people can start small and just always be delivering user value and kind of grow from there. Um, I think they're going to see a lot more success. And so, what's what's great is you know there's a there's a few a few podcasts now that have sprung up since uh, since SSI Meetup went on hiatus. And you know every every week or so, you get to hear a case study of of a really successful SSI product, and that's it's it's really heartwarming. Um, so I think I think this stuff is happening, Alex. I really do. Um, it's not it's not as quick as any of us thought it would be, given that these benefits are self evident to, to those of us who know about them. But I think if we if we remember to talk about them. A in terms of like who gets that benefit and the fact rather than the, the idea that it, it should it should be an end in its own. Uh and, and and B, if we focus on actually delivering that benefit, not delivering SSI for SSI's own sake, um, then we can accelerate that that transition, which I still think is inevitable. I think it would be really cool to do one episode again with you or as many as needed, right? Um, because I think there's one big thing that you brought up at the end um, where you suggested that about the business modeling, right? I think, and the same thing happens in the blockchain space, right? Where you have um, different dynamics about launching many protocols, but it has been discussed now for, for a couple of months or many months maybe, 
about, okay, what is the business model of all these protocols, right? DeFi protocols or whatever, how, how do they operate? Because some of them, they struggle with the treasury, so even yeah. some of the biggest ones or, or whatever. There's some 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 talk about that in uh, Twitter where, where, where they analyze that. Um, same things, same thing here, right? And it's interesting, I think, because in, in, in the blockchain space, people get in love with the technology. Same happens in SSI, but but then the pragmatic viewers are like, okay, look, <laughs> we need someone who thinks about the use case, the user problem, and how how do we create a sustainable business model out of this? I mean, this seems to be maybe not for discussion today, but if, but maybe if you want to hint on some of the ideas about it, um, that might be helpful. Yeah, I think I mean at the end of the day, it's uh, you just need more product managers, right? It's uh, it's it's not it's not a very well understood discipline actually uh because you know to some people it means writing requirements and managing backlogs and to other people it means uh poking around in figma and, and and coming up with uh with designs and to other people it means writing business plans and go to market strategies and of course the truth is it it can be all of that right so it's a very hard it's a very hard job to pin down uh it means different things in different companies and at different stages of someone's career uh but but ultimately you know that skill set is is what is required in spades in in these sorts of projects um and you know they don't necessarily even have to be having product people but there needs to be a, a, a product culture that that you know remembers you know we're we're here for the user and we can only do this if if the thing is is economically sustainable so there, there needs to be a business plan that accompanies it yeah i agree and it's also like i find like finding these people is incredibly complicated because it may, maybe it doesn't even live in a, in a single person. Maybe it's in a group of people yeah. that can do all those things, right? Like um, to find the technical product roadmap, um, work out the, the business vision and understanding and analyzing the business vision and how you're gonna monetize all that. It, it's just for, it feels to me, I don't, I don't know if this relates to you, like um, that's, that's the way I observed the Web3 space is that it's yeah i don't want to say it's impossible but it seems to be very difficult for me to to maybe find all the skill sets needed because all these things are so new and so fast moving that yeah. just keeping yourself up to date on a specific aspect of all the many different aspects you have to cover is extremely challenging yeah yeah no, i think so but you know look we we've we've both worked in startups for for, for a large part of our career you know it, you're always dropping plates right like as in you know you, you never you're never going to do that job perfectly as long as you're rigorously prioritizing though and you you get the the highest impact things done you you you'd probably be okay so so yeah i mean, i think that's, that's how i that's how i managed to sleep at night at least but uh but no i agree there is there's a huge amount that, that goes into it um and, and yeah ideally it would be a a, a whole multidisciplinary team team that, that worked on it so so yeah, let's see if we can let's see if we can get a panel together like that. It'd be it'd be really good to have a longer session. I agree. Yeah, yeah, we could use a format like that. Cool. Look, this has been amazing. I'm so excited that we we've been talking about this now for a couple of months. Yeah, and we should get started. Awesome. So awesome. now we've made it, and yeah. I think this is a great start. I, we don't know that. I mean, we have a couple of people we want to bring in, right? I mean, I, you should be doing the next one and um like just hosting and um and let's just let's we will just keep on polishing um and invite everyone to comment on what we can do better and just keep on inviting more people to share their knowledge absolutely yeah and, and we're worth remembering that you know if, if anyone wants to wants to come on they should get in touch if anyone wants us to go and reach out to someone to get them to come on they should just let us know um you know it's uh it's going to be great to get the ball rolling again on this Awesome. Thanks so much, James. Thanks so much, everyone who listened to this. Um, very excited to be back here with this. And yeah, I'll talk to you soon.